Hi everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us today. As you know, the Zika virus has been making national and international headlines recently, and we are lucky enough to have an expert, Dr. Peter Hotez, who's going to provide us with an overview of the virus. Dr. Hotez is Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine here at Baylor College of Medicine. He's the Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair in Tropical Pediatrics. He's the President of the Sabin Vaccine Institute and a U.S. Science Envoy for the State Department and the White House. And so please welcome Dr. Hotez. Thank you very much to Polly. I'm told this is being recorded and I have to stand right here. I can't walk around with the lavalier, so please forgive me for standing behind this thing. Uh, back in October of 2014, when Ebola hit Dallas, um, first of all, when these things happen, it's really good for my TV career. And one of the things that I, and it's happening again now, but one of the things that I do is try to collect my thoughts and try to think what the messages I want to say. And it's interesting how often they're at variance with what the Centers for Disease Control is saying or or what sometimes even what the World Health Organization is saying. And sometimes we're on the same page, sometimes we have some uh, modest disagreements, and that's happening again. And what I did back in October 2014, we organized a lecture similar to, to this one to kind of explain when I go on television and talk about it, what my thinking is uh, behind all that. And people found it very interesting and entertaining, so I talked to Lori and DePauli about doing something like that now that Zika is hitting the news. And now that the World Health Organization today is saying Zika will hit in any part of the Americas where 80s mosquitoes live, which we have all over the southeastern United States and the Gulf Coast, it's going to get even uh, more interesting. So I thought I would give an overview. Uh, let's try to keep it as informal. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Just remember, because it's being recorded, I have to repeat your question into the microphone when, when you ask it. Um, and this is the latest Zika map. Uh, it's spreading pretty rapidly across the Caribbean. Uh, we're looking at more than 20 uh, countries and territories. And uh, what we're saying is uh, that it's going to occupy the entire Caribbean. So it's been knocking off various Caribbean islands. I think it's already all over the Caribbean. It's just that in, not, in m many cases nobody, nobody's looking, but I think it's already there, and that's going to have a lot of economic implications uh, that we'll talk about as well. So the problem, the, the big problem that I have when I talk about Zika is there's nothing published about the outbreak in the Americas. There's one paper. And so what we're doing is connecting the dots because there's, no, there's nothing published. So it's all, and it's, and it's coming out in a very dysfunctional way as Ebola did when, when it happened in Dallas. So we're piecing together various reports and alerts from the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization, ProMed. It's amazing what information you're getting on Twitter, uh, emails with colleagues in Brazil, Flavivirus thought leaders, uh, journalists are actually providing some of the most active information. And we're very concerned about this. I'm an editor in chief of one of the public library of science journals, plus neglected tropical diseases. And we really think that that's a real problem, that there's nothing being vetted through some type of bio, standard biomedical literature. So there's a lot of information uh, being uh, released. And at, at PLOS, one of the things that we say is our current publishing model for science was actually created and shaped and it's still pretty much the same as it was when it was created in 19th century uh, Germany. We really haven't changed the way we disseminate scientific uh, information. And that's a problem because guess what? The world has changed since 19th century uh, Germany. So we're, stay tuned, we're about to launch something uh, big at the Public Library of Science on a radical departure for how we're going to publish and disseminate biomedical information. And this outbreak in Zika is a good example of why uh, we need to do this. So everything I'm going to tell you is not coming out of papers. It's coming out of bits and pieces trying to put, to, trying to put it together in a meaningful way. So just very briefly, Zika is an arbovirus. It means it's transmitted uh, by mosquitoes. It's, uh, it's also a flaviviruse, and the reason that's useful is other examples of flaviviruses, which are single-stranded positive RNA viruses, include dengue, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile, uh, and Zika virus is now uh, joining that. Most of them, are, except for West Nile, are transmitted by uh, 80s mosquitoes, and we're going to come back to that as well. And I'm going to go pretty quickly because there's a lot of information. 
Uh, it, it is generally not infectious from person to person, although there's some evidence of a rare possibility of sexual transmission or through blood products, but it's mostly as you're bitten by an Aedes mosquito uh, that, uh, has the, that, that has the virus, you become infected, then when you become viremic, have virus in your bloodstream, another mosquito comes along, bites you, and then transmits it uh, person to person. Uh, and in the New World, there's two major species, which I'll go into a little more detail, Aedes aegypti and uh, Aedes uh, albopictus. There's some disagreement uh, out there in terms of how closely related Zika virus is to dengue virus. And uh, I presented this to Rebecca Rico Hess. I'm Rebecca, I don't know if she's here uh, today, but she uh, uh, works on a flavivirus to show her this uh, evolutionary chart showing that Zika is most closely related to uh, dengue. And I constructed a very nice hypothesis around this that uh, the reason uh, we're seeing so much Zika in Brazil is because there's so much dengue in Brazil. And we know when you're previously in infected with uh, dengue, you develop an immune enhancement phenomena where you can get higher vi viremia and you can get worsening disease. So that being exposed from one dengue serotype to getting infected with another, that's where you get into problems with dengue hemorrhagic fever, dengue shock syndrome, and I constructed this very elegant hypothesis that maybe it's all the pre-existing dengue. And then Rebecca looked at this and said, no, that doesn't look right. You better keep looking around. And she was right. I did. The next point, place I looked showed a very different evolutionary uh, relationship between Zika and dengue. So the jury's still out in terms of how closely related uh, Zika is uh, with uh, dengue virus and how important pre-existing dengue infection is in all of the problems that we're seeing. So uh, Zika is a flavivirus. These are uh, small genomes, 11 KB, 10 genes. They create a single open reading frame. They only replicate uh, in the cytoplasm using our RNA polymerase uh, to replicate. They have uh, three structural proteins, a capsid protein, a uh, matrix protein, uh, and an envelope protein. And they also have uh, seven uh, non-structural proteins, including a protease that Clips, clips off that polyprotein so it can assemble into a, a, a virus. So uh, it did really did or originate, as far as we know, uh, in the Zika forest of Uganda, hence the name. Uh, there was first isolated from rhesus uh, monkeys. Uh, it was transmitted there by Aedes uh, africanus, found in 1947. Virus isolation was published in 52. And then the first human case was detected in Nigeria in 1954. And this was linked with mostly small uh, outbreaks, very few patients were actually diagnosed with uh, Zika virus at the time. And then something happened where uh, the number of cases seemed to have been greatly amplified so that uh, it got transported across the Indian Ocean into the Pacific Ocean, so that 11,000 cases appeared in the island of Yap in Micronesia in 2007. That was about 75 percent of the population. And then it made its way uh, going eastward through uh, to, through French Polynesia, there were 28,000 cases in Tahiti, and then it came in 2015 to Easter Island uh, off uh, the coast of Chile. And that, some people say that that is the route that it entered into uh, the Americas and entered into Brazil. Other people I spoke to and said, this doesn't sound right. I think it probably came in through the port of Bahia, coming in through an Atlantic route from Africa. So uh, we, there's still controversy about that. And remember, nothing's published. Um, and how do, when I think about how this disease is spreading across the Americas, I'm looking at the playbook that was uh, created by dengue and chikungunya. And this is why I have so much confidence that the virus was going to spread rapidly uh, across uh, the Caribbean. So, for instance, uh, dengue emerged uh, in the new, reemerged in the new world. Uh, in 1981, and this is just showing how quickly it spread uh, across the Americas wherever uh, 80s mosquitoes are. And then Christy Murray uh, on our faculty uh, found that dengue virus uh, emerged in Houston in 2003 and 2004, where we have outbreaks due to uh, 80s uh, mosquitoes. And chikungunya even spread more rapidly. This uh, came across uh, from an Asian route where it entered uh, in, into the New World in the island of St. Martin in the Caribbean in 2013, and over the course of, uh, of, of weeks, actually, it occupied every, practically every uh, Caribbean island, then came into Venezuela and Guiana. And so when, uh, with the, one of the interesting, and the reason that's relevant, I think, 
is when CDC only talked about travel advisories to pregnant women uh, in places where Zika is already known to be established, I said, you know, that doesn't sound right, knowing how rapidly this is going to spread across the Caribbean. And sure enough, the following week they had to revise their travel recommendations because it was just for initially on Puerto Rico and Martinique, then they had to add Guadalupe, then they had to add Barbados, and now yesterday it was announced that it's on the U.S. Virgin Islands, on the islands of St. Croix. And what this basically means to me is the entire Caribbean is going to be affected. And that's, a, that's an important statement when you go on Fox News or MSNBC because the Caribbean is entirely dependent on the tourist industry for its economic survival. So you have to recognize that that's going to, that could mess saying things like that is not trivial. It's going to have a huge uh, impact uh, on the region. Now the reason why these viruses are spreading across the Americas is because this is the range of the two uh, mosquito vectors that carry it, Aedes aegypti and uh, Aedes albopictus. And this is just showing how the range of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes has really expanded uh, quite a bit. There's some new maps put up by Simon Hay's group. Simon Hay used to be at Oxford University. Now he's at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, Seattle. And I just want to show you where these two mosquitoes uh, species are. So this is Aedes aegypti, which uh, bites, tends to bite only humans. Uh, and uh, it's widespread in Brazil and other parts of Latin America. And this is one of the reasons why I think the Gulf Coast is so vulnerable. That fine, fine rim of orange here, which includes uh, Houston, Texas, uh, is where Aedes aegypti hap happens to be. Uh, it's also present, uh, the second mosquito vector, Aedes albopictus, which is also known as the Asian tiger mosquito. This one also feeds on birds and mammals, uh, but it's much more widespread on the southern, southeastern part of the United States. There's only one paper in the literature on Aedes albopictus being a vector that can transmit the virus. But the big question we need to know now is which is more important, Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus? Right now we don't know that. Um, some people are saying it's more Aedes aegypti, but the point is we have two shots on goal here in Houston. We've got Aedes uh, aegypti here, uh, 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 here on the Gulf Coast, plus we also have Aedes albopictus. So we're blessed with both species of mosquitoes. Yes? What does it matter which species of mosquito it is if they both carry the disease? Well, what it matters, well, that's the question. The, the question is what does it matter if both carry the disease? The question is there's a, con there's a concept in mosquito biology known as vector competence, which means uh, that different mosquito species are more adept at, at transmitting the virus than others. So for instance, if we know Aedes aegypti is far more uh, able to transmit the disease than Aedes albopictus is, that would say to us, well, we have to worry more about Aedes aegypti areas than we would Aedes albopictus. So uh, th that's why we need to know that's a good question. Uh, the other thing that's happening other than Aedes albopictus is we're seeing this big uh, influx of Aedes albopictus into southern uh, Europe. So southern Europe has gone through this amazing change over the last three years where we're seeing this widespread uh, uptake uh, in uh, vector-borne uh, diseases over the last few years. So the weird things that are happening in the Western Hemisphere are not unique. It's also happening in southern Europe. So this is what's happened uh, over the last couple of years. We've seen the return of Vivax malaria to Greece after it's been gone for 60 years. We have uh, West Nile virus in, uh, in, in France in Italy and in uh, Spain. We have chikungunya in the same three countries. Dengue has reemerged in Portugal, uh, and even schistosomiasis in the island of Corsica. So we're really trying to understand what, what's going on here, uh, why this sudden uh, increase. We think part of this could be spillover from the diseases that are emerging out of the ISIS-occupied uh, zones uh, in, in Libya, in Iraq, in Syria, because we know just like Ebola, came out of uh, the conflict and post-conflict areas of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, we're seeing the same forces in play in ISIS-occupied territories. Uh, and this is my role as science envoy that I've taken on, that Tapali talked about, uh, where we're trying to look at, with Mary Elena Batazzi and others here at uh, Sabin and Texas Children's, building vaccine development capacity uh, in the region because there's no ability to make vaccines in the Middle East and North Africa or Southern Europe, despite this massive uh, influx of disease. So let's get back to Zika. Then in 2015, it, according to some, it jumped from Easter Island, Chile, and entered into Brazil, where it really took off.
uh, between uh, some estimates between 400,000 to a million cases uh, in Brazil. And I got this from a very reputable journal, the Washington Post. Um, and now some people are saying it's more like 1.4 million. Again, this frustration of not having really good, timely uh, information available. But that seems to be what's happening. And now uh, from Brazil, it's expanding rapidly across the Americas. So the new numbers are 700,000 cases into Colombia. So Colombia is getting hit very hard. And then into Venezuela. And now in the Caribbean islands, you've seen this progressive flow northward uh, into these different countries. So that by January, January, uh, now, currently, we're all over uh, the uh, Caribbean. So again, this is the latest map uh, in Bar uh, Barbados, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Puerto Rico. But now it's in the, the U.S. Virgin Islands as well. Mexico is entirely lit up, but it's almost all in Chiapas right now, near Guatemala and Central America. And, you know, we don't have Nicaragua here, but maybe it's there, just nobody's looking. Uh, and so we think the entire Americas is going to be uh, affected uh, very soon. So the clinical, the, the other unknown piece of this are what the clinical features are. So classically, uh, our flaviviruses produce this sequence of events, fever, immaculopapular rash, which is due to viremia, the presence of virus in the bloodstream going to the skin, headache and retroorbital uh, pain. Uh, but there's a lot of controversy as to the percentage of people who are infected with Zika who actually have symptoms. And you're reading everything from one in five uh, are actually asymptomatic, show no symptoms, to as much as 80% showing uh, no symptoms at all. And that's going to be very problematic when we come up with recommendations for pregnancy, which I'll get back to in a minute. Um, what are, where are we at with diagnostic testing? So right now, uh, you cannot contact Quest Labs or a typical commercial lab and get the Zika test. So it's not available in commercial labs, although uh, Jim Versalovic uh, at Texas Children's and others are working with Quest to try to make that happen. But right now, the only reference laboratory are the CDC laboratories in Fort Collins, Colorado, that handles vector-borne disease. So I'm hopeful that a commercial lab test will be out in two to three months. Right now, if you have a patient that you suspect could have Zika, uh, the, the, what I suggest suggest you do is contact either Dr. Steger at Ben Taub uh, Hospital or Jim Dunn, who's at Texas Children's Hospital, is one of the microbiologists there in the laboratory. And what they'll do is they'll send those labs direct. They don't go through the state for this one. They're going directly to the CDC labs in Fort Collins, where they're doing a, an RT-PCR uh, uh, test. There's also uh, serum for IgM and IgG detection. The tough part to work out there is the cross-reactivity uh, between Zika and other arboviruses, uh, which could be uh, quite high. The next thing we're seeing among uh, older children and adults with Zika, and the link has still not been conclusively proven, is uh, the link between neurological symptoms. So there's some literature out there suggesting that Zika is a neurotropic virus, although it's based on mostly on mouse studies. But there has been a big up tick in the number of Guillain-Barre cases. So Guillain-Barre is, is typically a, an autoimmune response to various insults, which includes virus infections. Remember during the swine flu outbreak in 1970, uh, the sw swine flu uh, vaccination campaign in 1976, there were some Guillain-Barre cases. We're seeing a fair bit of Guillain-Barre in Brazil, a big jump in El Salvador. Um, it still has not been conclusively linked, but there's quite a concern uh, about that as well. Uh, the, uh, the good news about our reporting system is the World Health Organization introduced these IHR rules, International Health Regulations Mandating Reporting, in 2005. And this is what first led us to this tip-off beginning in September, October of last year, that we're seeing something really unusual with large numbers of infants being born with a small head circumference, a condition known as microcephaly. And there was a 20% increase noted in northeastern Brazil with almost 4,000 cases of microcephaly that hadn't been seen before. And there was a lot of concern noted that uh, it temporarily coincided uh, with the introduction of Zika several months uh, before uh, then into, into Brazil. So microcephaly is defined 
as the occipital frontal circumference more than three standard deviations below the mean for a given age, sex, and generation. Uh, uh, other times it's defined more than two standard deviations, uh, but that's uh, the big concern. So, um, and these are what some of these kids with microcephaly look like. Um, and this is now a mandatory reporting requirement in Brazil. And this is the only paper that's been published from the Brazil uh, epidemic. It's and it's a journal called Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology. And one of the observations is that when you do a brain ultrasound, you're seeing a lot of these cerebral calcifications, which is a classic hallmark of congenital virus infection, like congenital rubella infection and congenital cytomegalovirus infection. And the calcifications are probably due to uh, granulomas uh, to uh, the virus insult that, subs that sub subsequently become uh, calcified. So that's a bad sign. Uh, then we're also seeing a lot of destruction of brain tissue with ventriculomegaly. Uh, these are big dilated ventricles, uh, eye calcifications. There's also been this interesting, in one case, an absent thalamus. And that kind of sent red flags because that's not something you'd expect to see in a congenital uh, virus infection unless it's happening very early on. So these kinds of horrific changes are probably linked to uh, uh, infection early in the pregnancy, either on the time of conception or the first few weeks of a pregnancy in the first trimester. So that's probably the window period where the vulnerability is greatest. I get a lot of questions saying, well, what about if I'm in the second trimester or third trimester? And the answer is, of course, Nothing's published, so we, we don't know. So this is, this is, this is a big unknown. Um, we do know that uh, in terms of pathogenesis, that viruses like congenital uh, rubella syndrome are occurring because the virus uh, can uh, enter into the placenta, go to the fetal circulation, and then it has the ability, when it infects neuronal tissue, to inhibit replication and also uh, triggers a lot of apoptotic events. So that may be the pathogenesis of why you're seeing all of this destruction to the central nervous system. It's also useful because the last time we had an outbreak of a virus that caused congenital disease like this was actually in the early 1960s before we had the rubella vaccine. So when you get, when we get today, we give MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, together, and the rubella component came out of the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia, led by Stan Plotkin, who uh, noticed that uh, in, in Philadelphia in 1961 or 62, 1% of the pregnancies were complicated by congenital uh, rubella syndrome, uh, and that's what, led, that's what uh, stimulated the development of the vaccine. One of the big questions that we still, I'm sorry, is there a question in the back? Yeah, um, what are the the so that's a great question. So the question is, what is the percentage, so if you're, uh, what is the percentage of microcephaly cases relative to the number of women who are pregnant who become infected with Zika virus? That's your question. And the answer is? We have no clue. Uh, this, so there's, there's the, no epidemiology published, and that's really important, right? Is it 10%? Is it 1%? Is it 0.1%? Is it 0.0001%? So when you're trying to make guidelines, we're basically sh shooting blind. This is, this is a real urgent problem that we have. So most of the microcephaly cases uh, seem to be concentrated in northeastern Brazil, uh, Pernambuco State, uh, Bahia, uh, this is where uh, most of the microcephaly cases uh, appear to be uh, concentrated currently. Um, and what's the evidence that these microcephaly cases are linked to Zika virus? So there are three bits of information, uh, and this is all coming out of WHO PAHO alerts and emails from colleagues. So Zika genome has been detected in the amniotic fluid of pregnant women who have microcephalic, microcephalic babies by ultrasound. Uh, it's been the, the CDC has detected in the placenta of two women who miscarried, and the Zika, Zika genome has been identified in the blood and other tissues of newborns born with microcephaly. Now, despite, that's pr to me, that's pretty strong evidence, but if you look at the official WHO and CDC uh, information, they're still kind of hedging their bets on whether this really is linked to microcephaly. From my position, what, what I'm saying is it's close enough 
so we can't take the risk. This is one of the real challenging uh, problems when you're thinking about preventing Zika virus infection. Uh, if you're wrong, you're not going to know about it right away. You're not going to know about it till nine months later when microcephaly cases start appearing in labor and delivery suites in, in various uh, areas. So from my perspective, there's no uh, margin for error. It's not like when you're trying to control a typical virus. I mean, if you have Ebola and somebody else gets Ebola, you're going to know about it within two weeks, or the, the, which is roughly the incubation period. This is, we're not dealing with this here. We're dealing with something that's silent, not only is clinically silent, but also uh, silent until we, that nine-month window period before uh, the baby's born with microcephaly. So what's happened is uh, ministries of health of these following countries uh, have called on women to delay getting pregnant. So, and, that's, and there's some interest here. So for instance, in the, in the Dominican Republic, there's been no Zika virus cases identified. I think the Minister of Health has appropriately recognized this thing, it's in Haiti, it's spreading all over the Caribbean. If, if it isn't there now, it, it will be. And again, it's women early in, in their pregnancy. Now, the Minister of Health in El Salvador has now made the recommendation to delay pregnancy, on, if possible, till 2018. Why 2018? Anybody want to make a guess? I don't know either, by the way, but I'll just <laughs> make, make a guess. My guess is what they're assuming is that the disease is spreading rapidly. The, most of the population, most of that cohort will become infected, have antibodies, and then be resistant by 2018. So we're looking at the problem of a novel virus being introduced uh, into uh, the population. So these are the CDC pregnant guidelines, pregnancy guidelines. Um, and I have a few problems with these. So uh, you don't have to, and I've been discussing these with uh, uh, Kirstie, uh, Kirstie Agard and, and others in uh, OBGYN. And the first part here, a uh, pregnant woman reports clinical illness consistent with Zika virus. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward, but if we're talking about 80% of pregnant women never show clinical symptoms, it doesn't give you a lot to go on. So we're basically dealing with this one over here, which is pregnant woman does not report clinical illness, but has been traveling. So it's entirely based on travel history to a Zika endemic area or a place where you think Zika is happening. And then the idea is to do serial ultrasounds to detect microcephaly or intracellular uh, calci intracranial calcifications. The problem is this, my, the OBGYN colleagues here tell me, and maybe if we have some in the audience they can confirm that, you really can't de cannot detect uh, specifically microcephaly until 24 to 28 weeks gestational age. And if that's the case in Texas and 20 other states, it's illegal to perform abortion after 24 weeks. So that basically you're doing the serial uh, ultrasounds to document a disaster that's pending rather than anything that's really preventative at that point. So these, these are really very unsatisfactory travel recommendations, from my opinion. I think what's going to probably have to happen is once you document some level of transmission of Zika in a community, if you have a good test, it's going to require universal screening during the first trimester of pregnancy, and you may have to do that serially. serially. But again, this is all kind of fluid and all being worked out. Um, so what are the factors that are fueling uh, this, uh, Zika migrate, uh, this uh, Zika outbreak? And I want to talk to you about a few of them that I think uh, may be partly responsible. And this also is relative to the big outbreaks of vector-borne diseases uh, that we're seeing uh, in southern Europe. So let's look at uh, human migrations first. When you read uh, the New York Times or the Washington Post or other authoritative sources for biomedical information, one of the things you see out there is maybe this was introduced into Brazil during the 2014 uh, World Cup. And so it was associated with, with that. Uh, when I mentioned that on one of the news broadcasts, I got uh, an email from somebody in Brazil saying, no, you dummy, it wasn't the, the 2014 World Cup. It was the World Canoe Competition that came around the same time. Who knew? Uh, and there was a big team from French Polynesia where uh, the uh, Zika virus had come from, maybe. Uh, 
They, and we have a lot of human migratory activity in the New World. Uh, those of you who are following what the events is happening in Brazil, in Venezuela, there's been a big diaspora out of Venezuela fleeing the collapsed uh, government there. So there's a lot of uh, human movement. And we're seeing that, of course, in the Middle East and North Africa with people fleeing the conflict areas, coming across the Mediterranean in horrible boats, or uh, getting into uh, getting into the Middle East via Eastern Europe. So that, that may uh, be an important factor. Um, in terms of climate, uh, this is an El Nino year. Uh, so when uh, the temperatures uh, in the Pacific Ocean uh, warm up, and as a result, uh, there are changes in rainfall, rainfall pattern that are unusually heavy, due, uh, resulting in flooding. Maybe this is facilitating uh, 80s mosquitoes. So could the fact that we're seeing this widespread spread uh, across Latin America and into the Caribbean be related to the two El Nino events? I think that's something that we have to look at seriously. But the other piece that people don't ordinarily think about is poverty especially extreme poverty. And here's some pictures of very heavily affected cities in uh, northeastern Brazil, in Recife, in Pernambuco, in Salvador de Bahia. And what you see are people, if not living outdoors, they're living in places that have no uh, window screens or that have holes in the window screens or no air conditioning. So they're constantly exposed to uh, mosquito bites. Uh, and top of that, what you often see in these, uh, in these uh, cities uh, is a lot of environmental degradation. So garbage collects, and this allows the mosquitoes to uh, proliferate. Uh, it also, uh, you see discarded tires along the sides of the road that are filled with water. So these are all the events linked with poverty that I think heavily is promoting the rise of hyperendemic Zika in Pernambuco and then leading to the congenital uh, uh, cases. Uh, so where's the next shoe that's going to fall? When I heard that Zika virus uh, had entered Haiti, uh, my heart really sank because uh, you can imagine what it's like now, and, and then there were five cases in Port-au-Prince, people living in Port-au-Prince. This is a, not an unusual uh, picture. You've got the standing water for the mosquitoes. You don't have to be an entomologist to figure out that this little girl is going to be at risk for uh, Zika uh, because she's got complete exposure to uh, mosquitoes, environmental degradation, the mosquitoes are proliferating. So I'm very worried of what we're going to see now that uh, Zika is in Haiti, what's going to happen in nine months. And really across the poor areas of the Caribbean, uh, we're, um, Jamaica for instance, I'm worried about uh, uh, Zika becoming a huge problem there. And, and these are uh, areas with depleted health systems uh, to begin with. So how are we going to do the screening? How are we going to do any kind of meaningful algorithms from an obstetrics uh, point of view? So we'll come back to some ideas for control. What about the Gulf Coast of the U.S.? Do we have poor people in the Gulf Coast of the U.S.? So this is our, these are pictures taken by Anna Grove, who is our sometimes grants and contracts manager, but also our unofficial photographer. Is Anna here? Oh, there she is. So these are some pictures she took uh, for a book that I'm com right, coming out in the spring on diseases of the poor that live amidst wealth. And uh, these are pictures right from the Fifth Ward, actually next to Worm Street. Believe it or not, there is a Worm Street in the Fifth Ward. Um, and what you see is housing without, houses without window screen, environmental degradation, discarded tires along the side of the road. It looks like you know the picture you show, uh, the global health movie you show to the first year public health students, but it's right here in the poorer parts of uh, Houston. So I think uh, one of the things that I'm particularly worried, I'm worried about the Gulf Coast because we have both species of mosquitoes. And I'm worried, and this is not unique, what we're seeing. You can find this in a lot of uh, coastal cities, certainly in New Orleans or Mobile uh, or Tampa and the poor areas. So these are the areas where I'm worried. And when Christy Murray was looking at the dengue outbreak in 2003, 2004, 2005, she was able to overlap a lot of the cases with uh, zip codes that had higher the highest levels of poverty. So poverty is going to become a particular uh, risk factor. Other the considerations, is this going to devastate the Caribbean economy? Uh, we'll have to see. Um, I mean, who goes to the, who goes to the Caribbean? Right? You know, I know you go to the Caribbean, but, but, but that's not what I'm trying to get at. Most people go to the Caribbean. They're the young, beautiful people, right, who are, who are 
pregnant or planning on becoming pregnant or not planning on becoming pregnant, but they're going to the Caribbean. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so this, this, this is going to be a real chill, right, on, uh, on the economy of the region. Poor Puerto Rico, right, where uh, it's already reeling under horrific debt. Now you're going to uh, suck the life out of its tourist economy. Uh, this is not going to be good. Uh, I get asked a lot about the 2016 Olympics in Brazil. And at this point, things are so fluid right now. And basically what I'm saying is it's still a few months away. Let's see how this epidemic unfolds. I don't think we can really make recommendations for the Summer uh, Olympics uh, at this point. So uh, there's a lot of research questions. Some of you already are, have already asked this, mechanisms of neurotropism. What's the risk period of pregnancy? Is it only first trimester, first and second? Is it all trimesters? Only during viremia? Is there chronic persistence of the virus? Do you get infected, make an antibody response, and that's it? Or does the virus persist? So Christy Murray and uh, Melissa Nolan Garcia have done some beautiful studies on West Nile virus showing that you get a chronic persistent state uh, in the kidney, uh, for instance, leading to chronic renal disease. Is, is that what we're dealing with? What are the rates of vertical transmission? Somebody asked about that. And then we get to public health preparedness. Mosquito surveillance, population surveillance, which groups, public health messaging, I'll come back to that. Uh, talk about which kind of insecticides are we going to uh, push for, uh, new technologies. Uh, so what about bed nets? Could bed nets have a role? And I think this is something that, which is relatively low cost, it's been effective in parts of sub-Saharan Africa for malaria prevention. Is this going to be the key to Haiti, is widespread uh, distribution of insecticide-treated nets? Uh, I don't know. Nobody's talking about that, but I think that's something we have to consider. Uh, mosquito bite prevention is going to be very important, uh, especially if we document transmission on the Gulf Coast to eliminate standing water in and around the home, repair cracks in septic tanks, keep mosquitoes out of your home. In terms of an EPA-registered insecticide, the CDC and the WHO on their website list D, uh, picaridin, IR3535, and oil of eucalyptus. Most people are saying DEET is the most effective. There's been some uh, lack of clarity about safety in pregnancy. On the CDC and WHO websites, they're saying DEET is safe. But when you actually go into it, what, what a lot of people are saying, well, it's really not well studied. So I'm getting tweets and emails from pregnant women or spouses of pregnant women or fathers of pregnant women asking, is DEET safe? And I'm basically saying, talk to your, that's a decision you have to make in consultation with your obstetrician because there have been reproductive tox toxicities noted in when you give high doses of DEET to mice and rats, and, and that's something to take into consideration. So when you talk to the OBs here, some of them are saying, oh, we don't recommend DEET. So there's, there seems to be a, a, a uh, difference of opinion about the safety of DEET in pregnancy. What are some of the new technologies? Uh, there's a couple of them that are being looked at. One are these genetically modified Aedes mosquitoes where they alter male mosquitoes so that the offspring they father don't develop uh, properly. And this is a company that came out of Oxford University, and it's called Oxitech, and I think it's been bought up by uh, another company called uh, in Trexon. And so these are the field, res there's been some exciting field result tests with OX513A, which is a, an 80s Egypti mosquito that's been uh, modified uh, to produce, uh, to decrease eggs. And they're, the company's reporting some uh, good uh, trial results in Brazil. I haven't seen this peer-reviewed in the biomedical literature. So it's looking, at, it's looking promising, but I don't know what kind of rates and reductions you have to see to have a public health impact. I'm also hearing there's some disagreements between the company uh, and the Brazilian government over some things, so we don't really know exactly what the status is, but the technology is looking uh, very promising. Uh, a Zika vaccine would be nice. Uh, to administer to women of reproductive age. It would, have to, would not be a live vaccine. It would have to either be a recombinant protein vaccine, a uh, virus-like particle, or maybe a killed uh, inactivated mis uh, vaccine. Uh, here's a problem that we have with neglected disease vaccines. There's not been the traditional market incentive, so we tend to wait for a disaster before a big pharmaceutical company licenses the technology, and we wait for BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, to put up lots of money to license it. So this happened with Ebola. This is a paper 
that was published in Nature Magazine by Gary Nabel's group at NIH uh, on, the, on the adenovirus-based Ebola vaccine. It was published in 2003, and the technology sat there for 11 years because nobody cared about an Ebola vaccine. It was only when things got dire in West Africa that Barter put up $100 million, and all of a sudden GlaxoSmithKline, Merck, and Crucell all started making Ebola vaccines. They were, they were pr produced and for large-scale clinical testing in record time, but record time and time enough for the Ebola outbreak to have vanished by then. So it was a complete failure uh, in the system. So we don't even know to this day really whether the Ebola vaccine works. And we're seeing the same thing again with Zika. We sure like a Zika vaccine now, but uh, Mary Elena, how many years are we away from a Zika vaccine? Well, I, I, I never say, you never say 20 to investors. I say two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know, could we do a record turnaround time? I, I think it's possible. It just goes you the, the system is broken. That's why we're trying to make vaccines in the nonprofit sector. What I've been arguing is we just the old model of waiting around for a big pharma to come and license something is a broken model. We have to incentivize nonprofit product development partnerships like ours here at Baylor and Texas Children's Hospital or developing country vaccine manufacturers. Uh, one of the developing countries vaccine manufacturers has said uh, in their public statements that they're now making a Zika vaccine. Uh, and this is Instituto Butantan that we've worked with a lot. They have a snake as their symbol because they used to make snake antivenoms at the turn of the 20th century. Now they make at least half of uh, Brazil's vaccines. So what are they making? Are they making an inactivated vaccine like the Salk vaccine, a recombinant protein vaccine like hepatitis B or a VLP like cervical cancer? We don't know, but um, Jorge Khalil runs it. We'll, we'll hopefully have that conversation with him. And this is what we're trying to do uh, here at Baylor. So that's it. If anybody has any questions, otherwise, thank you very much.